കേംബ്രിഡ്ജ് ഐ ജി സി എസ് സി ഫെബ്രുവരി മാർച്ച് ട്വൻറ്റി ട്വൻറ്റി വൺ പേപ്പർ ട്വൻറ്റി ടു ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ നമ്പർ വൺ എ സ്റ്റുഡൻറ്റ് ഹാസ് എ മെഷറിംഗ് സിലിണ്ടർ കണ്ടെയ്നിങ് വാട്ടർ ആൻഡ് ഓൾസോ ഹാസ് എ ബാലൻസ് വിച്ച് ഓഫ് ദീസ് കൂഡ് ഷി യൂസ് ടു ഫൈൻ ദ വോളിയം ഓഫ് എ സ്മോൾ മെട്രിസ്പിയർ ഷി ഹാസ് നോ അതർ അപ്പാരറ്റസ് ഇൻ ഓർഡർ ടു മെഷർ ദി വോളിയം ഓഫ് എ സ്മോൾ മെറ്റൽ സ്പിയർ വെദർ ഇറ്റ് റെഗുലർലി ഷേപ്ഡ് ഓർ ഇറെഗുലർലി ഷേപ്ഡ് വി നീഡ് എ മെഷറിംഗ് സിലിണ്ടർ വിച്ച് ഈസ് ഫിൽഡ് വിത്ത് വാട്ടർ ദെൻ മെഷർ ദ ഇനീഷ്യൽ വോളിയം ആഫ്റ്റർ ദാറ്റ് വി ക്യാൻ പുട്ട് ദിസ് സ്പിയർ ഓൾസോ ഇൻ ടു ദി വാട്ടർ സോ ദ വാട്ടർ ലെവൽ വിൽ ഇൻക്രീസ് ടു എ ന്യൂ വോളിയം ദെൻ വി ക്യാൻ മെഷർ ദി ന്യൂ വോളിയം ലെവൽ that is v2 then we can sub- subtract v2 minus v1 so that will be the volume of the sphere so here we only need a measuring cylinder which is filled with water and no need to use any balance because here we don't have to measure the mass or weight or density so let's look at the options option a says either the measuring cylinder containing water or balance but with balance we cannot measure the volume so option a is wrong option b the measuring cylinder containing water only yes that is the correct answer question number 2 a ball hits a bat with a velocity of 30 meter per second and leaves the bat traveling with a velocity of 20 meter per second so we have initial velocity which we can represent with the letter u and final velocity that is v in the opposite direction both the velocities are are in opposite direction the ball is in contact with the bat for 0.10 seconds so the time is also provided what is the magnitude of the acceleration of the ball while it is in contact with the bat so we need to calculate acceleration we have initial final velocity and time so here you can use the basic equation of acceleration that is acceleration is equal to v minus u over t here we have the values v is the final velocity that is 20 minus initial velocity is 30 but we know that v and u are in opposite direction so the 30 we can put with an opposite sign that is minus 30 over time is 0.10 so 20 these two minus together minus times minus it will become plus so we will get plus 30 over 0.10 50 over 0.10 So the answer is 500 since it is acceleration 500 meter per second square. So the correct answer is option D. Question number 3. A train begins a journey from a station and travels 60 km in a time of 20 minutes. What is the average speed of the train? So we are provided with the distance traveled and the time taken. we need to calculate average speed so here we can use the equation of average speed and the equation is average speed is equal to total distance traveled by total time taken so here we have the total distance travel that is 60 km but the standard unit of distance is meter so we need to convert kilometer into meter where kilo always represent 10 to the power 3 or 1000 so here we can multiply the 60 times 10 to the power 3 in order to convert kilometer to meter over time is 20 minutes again we need to convert the unit of time from minutes to second so we should multiply with 60 and the answer is 50 meter per second so correct answer is option c Question 4 which statement about mass is correct let's look at each statement option a a mass of 10 kg weighs 1 newton 
so here it's mentioned that if mass is 10 kilogram its weight will be 1 newton let's find if we have mass weight we can calculate using the equation w is equal to weight is equal to mg m is 10 and g value is 10 so the weight will become 100 newton so an object with mass 10 kg will weight 100 newton but here it's mentioned that 1 newton so that is wrong so option a is wrong option b says mass is a gravitational force that is wrong weight is a gravitational force mass is simply the amount of substance so option b is also wrong option c mass increases when the gravitational field strength increases that is also wrong because we know that mass is not depending on any such factors it's only depending on the amount of substance or particles consist of that object and it will be same everywhere whether the object is on earth or any other planet or even in the space the mass will be a constant value part d the greater the mass of the body the more it resists a change in its motion that is correct as we know when the mass increases inertia will increase or the heavier the object it will resist more to change its position so option d is correct so exactly we can use the definition of mass that is mass is the property of an object that resists the change of its motion going to question 5 a small bottle has a mass of 20 gram when empty the volume of the bottle is 10 centimeter cube when full of liquid the total mass is 150 gram what is the density of the liquid so initially we have a bottle which is em empty and its mass is given that mass is 20 gram when it filled with particular liquid its mass has increased from 20 gram to 150 gram the new mass that is the mass of the bottle with the liquid from this we can calculate the mass of the liquid by subtracting the total mass that is 150 gram minus the mass of the empty bottle that is 20 gram so we will get 130 gram now we have the mass of the liquid next we can find out the volume of the liquid as the liquid is filled with the bottle liquid will also have the same volume of the bottle and which is given as 10 centimeter cube so we have the mass of the liquid and volume of the liquid so we can calculate the density using the equation density is equal to mass over volume we can substitute the values here mass is 130 gram over volume is 10 centimeter cube so we will get 13 gram over centimeter cube so this is the density of this given liquid hence the correct answer is option c going to question number six an object of mass 0 0.80 kilogram is moving in a straight line at a velocity of 20 meter per second a force is exerted on the object in the direction of motion for a period of period of time of one minute and the velocity of the object increases to six meter per second so an object is moving initially in a straight line with a initial velocity two meter per second it is move it was moving in a straight line but a force is applied on this object for one minute so the speed of the object increased and the new speed is that is represented by v is 6 meter per second and we need to calculate 
what force is exerted on the object in order to gain a speed of 6 meter per second so we have mass mass is provided initial velocity is provided final velocity is provided and time is also given and we need to calculate force so let's think which equation we can use which relates all these terms so here we can use force is a rate of change of momentum that is force is equal to rate of change of momentum this is a very important definition in physics so where what is change in momentum final momentum minus initial momentum that is mv minus mu over t, t time duration where the force applied here we have all the values we can substitute mass is 0 0.80 mass is common so we can take outside Inish final velocity 6 minus initial velocity is 2 over time Time is 1 minute, so we need to convert into seconds. So 1 into 60, and the answer is 0 0.053 Newton. So the correct answer is option A. Question 7 An object moves at constant speed in a circular path. Which statement about the acceleration of the object when it is at point P is correct? So there is an object which is moving in a circular path as shown in the figure and we need to check when this object is at the position x about its acceleration at this point which statement is correct. So this is a circular motion. So about circular motion there are some important point that we must know where the first point is in order to to move any object in a circular motion there must be a resultant force acting on the object and that resultant force should be always directing to the center of that circular motion that means if something is moving in a circular path and suppose the object is at this position and it still keep moving in circular path and at this particular position there must be a resultant force acting the center of the circular path then only the object can move in a circular path if the object at this position and in order to still keep moving in circular path there must be a resultant force which should act to the center of the circular path so this is very very important point we need to know about circular motion that there should be always a net force acting on the object and it should direct towards the center of the circular path so that is the first and most important point the net force or the resultant force on an object which should act and that resultant force should always direct towards the center of the force center of the circular path in order to make that object to keep moving in that circular path the moment that there is not enough resultant force which is acting towards the center then the object cannot keep move in the circular path anymore so now we realize that this object when it is at position P, as it is still moving in a circular path, there must be a resultant force acting and the direction should be always to the center of the circle. So there is a net resultant force acting on the object towards the center. That's why it's moving in a circular path. If there is a force acting, there will be an acceleration also acting to the same direction because we have learned in Newton's second law, force is directly proportional to acceleration. So there will be an acceleration also or the object will be accelerating in the same direction of the net resultant force as F and acceleration are directly proportional. So that is the second point 
as net resultant force is towards the center there will be an acceleration on the object or the acceleration of the object also will be towards the center now let's look at the options so these points about circular motion is very very important you will have to use this concept in most of the questions based on the circular motion so option a says the acceleration is in the direction of the arrow x that is wrong the acceleration is in the direction of arrow y that is also wrong the acceleration is in the direction of arrow z yes that is correct because we know that the force is acting towards z so if the force is acting then the acceleration will also act in the same direction so the correct answer is option c anyway let's look at option d option d says that the object is not accelerating that is wrong even though its speed is constant in a circular motion as at every point its direction is keep changing it is always an accelerated motion circular motion is always an accelerated motion even though its speed is constant as the direction is changing question 8 an object is pivoted at point a a student ties a length of string to a peg on the object he pulls the string with a force f what is the moment of the force f about the point p so we need to calculate the moment f at point p moment of force f at point p we have to calculate so in the figure we can see that this point is pivot and a force is acting on this string in this given direction so from pivot to this line of action of force we can draw a perpendicular line this is the perpendicular line or by measuring this distance we will get the perpendicular distance from the pivot to line of action of force we need that in order to measure the moment as the equation of moment is force times perpendicular distance from the pivot to the line of action of force so this is the line of action of force or the direction where we apply force from the line of action of force the perpendicular distance from the pivot represented by this yellow line this line and the distance is given by the letter s so we will get moment force is represented by f times perpendicular distance is represented by s hence the correct answer is option c question 9 a gas molecule strikes the wall of a container the molecule rebounds with the same speed so a, a gas molecule which is moving towards the wall when it hits the wall it rebounds back in opposite direction what happens to the kinetic energy and what happens to the momentum of the molecule so we need to check when the ball rebounds what will happen to kinetic energy and momentum so here first of all we should know that kinetic energy is a scalar quantity but momentum is a vector quantity that means when the direction change for a vector quantity its its value will change as direction matters but for scalar quantity the direction change is not going to affect so for kinetic energy it's a scalar quantity and its equation is half mv square and in this question even after rebounding the speed remains same and we know that the mass is also same so that the whole quantity will remain same so the kinetic energy stays same even after the rebounds but for momentum as we know that its direction is completely changing so that since it is a vector quantity momentum will change even though its magnitude will remain constant but we have to put a opposite sign 
So correct answer is kinetic energy stays same but momentum changes. So option C is correct answer. Going to question 10. A horizontal force pulls a box along a horizontal surface. The box gains 30 joule of kinetic energy and 10 joule of thermal energy is produced by the friction between the boxes and the surface. How much work done by the force? So this is a very simple concept. As we know that work done is equal to the energy and in this case the energy is transferred in two different forms one is kinetic energy and the remaining is thermal energy so the total energy will be 30 joule plus 10 joule so we will get 40 joule that means if we need to transform a 40 joule of energy or if we need to consume a 40 joule of energy we need to work same joule so the energy total energy transferred will be same as the work done hence the correct answer is option d question 11 a crane is used to lift loads vertically the output power of the crane to lift a car is p the crane then lifts a lorry which has three times the weight of the car through 0.25 of the distance in 0.50 of the time. What is the output power of the crane now? In this given question, a crane is lifting a car and a lorry. So here we have a lorry and a car. Some additional information is also given that the time taken to lift the lorry is only 0 0.50 times of the time taken to lift the car. That means if the time taken to lift the car is t, then the time taken to lift the lorry is only half of that. So it will be t over 2 and the weight of the lorry is 3 times greater than the weight of the car. From this we can conclude that the, if the weight of car is w, the weight of lorry will be 3 times w as weight and mass are directly proportional. Mass will be 3 times greater than the mass of a car. And the lorry has lifted only 0.25 times the distance of the car lifted. That means if the car has lifted to a height of h the lorry has lifted only one fourth of that height so h over 4 or 0 0.25 times of h now the output power of the car p is given that is p and we need to find out the equation for the output power of the crane in order to lift the lorry so for car the power in order to lift the car is the equation of power is rate of doing energy or energy over time where here the energy is gravitational potential energy the car is gaining gravitational potential energy when it is lifted because its height is increasing so energy is gravitational potential energy over time and the equation of gravitational potential energy is mass of the car here the mass of the car is represented by m so we can write m times g times height again we use the letter h for the height distance by the car so we will get mgh over time we again use the symbol t for car so we can use t here so this is the output power of car now we can look at what is the output power of the crane to lift the lorry so for lorry how much power the train should have in order to lift it so again we can use the same equation for power for lorry energy over time where energy is again gravitational potential energy over time gravitational potential energy is mass of the mgh that is mass of the lorry so mass of the lorry is three times m 
g is again constant because it's depending only on the earth gravitational potential uh, gravitational field strength times height height travel by the glory is only h over 4 so we can substitute these values so we will get in mass it is 3m times g is g only but height is h over 4 over time is t over 2 so this 2 will go to the numerator and 4 will go to the denominator so we will get 3 times 2 from the denominator that is t over 2 times m times g times h over 4 from the top will come to the bottom so we will get 4 times t so 6 times mgh over 4t that is 3 mgh over 2t but we already have power of the crane in order to lift the car is p and that is mgh over t so instead of mgh over t we can substitute p so we will get 3 over 2 times p hence the correct answer is option b question number 12 the diagram shows a manometer connected to a gas supply what is the pressure of the gas supply so we have a manometer here as you can see which is connected to a gas supply and we need to find what is the pressure of this gas supply so the pressure of the gas supply will be equal to the pressure at this level and as the pressure in a liquid at in the same level is always same so this is also the other side of the nanometer also we have a point where the same level is coming so the pressure at any point in the liquid at this level will be same so in order to find out what is the gas pressure we just need to find what is the pressure at this point so pressure at this point will be the sum of the atmospheric pressure which is ex exerting at the top of this liquid plus the sum of this liquid which is staying above the level which we have labeled so plus pressure of liquid at this level or at this height and pressure of liquid at this height we can find out that is the pressure difference from the bottom and top and that value will be the difference of these two values that is 300 mm minus 100 mm so we will get 200 mm of hg so that is the pressure of the liquid above this level so we can write pressure of gas is equal to the pressure in the same level at the other side of the manometer and that is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus liquid pressure and liquid pressure we have calculated that is 200 mm of hydrogen so we can understand the pressure of the gas will be 200 mm of hydrogen plus pressure of the atmosphere so here the correct answer is 200 mm hydrogen above an atmospheric pressure correct answer is option c question 13 the diagram shows a box of dimensions 6 cm 8 cm and 4 cm the boxes rest the box rest on a flat horizontal surface on which face must the box rest in order to exert a least pressure in order to check which face must the box rest in order to exert the least pressure we can look at the equation of the pressure that is pressure is equal to force over area so by looking at the equation we can understand to reduce the pressure 
the area which is at the denominator should have a greater value now we have three surfaces surface x surface y and surface z out of these surfaces surface x is having a greater area so the pressure will be least so the face must the box to rest in order to exert least pressure is face x where face x is having a greater area question 14 air in a sealed syringe is slowly compressed by moving the piston the temperature of the air stays the same which statement about the air is correct so the piston is compressing so that the volume will reduce or the piston will come inside the syringe that will this will be the new position of the syringe but temperature is still remaining same then what will happen to the air inside this compressed air so here something we must understand that as the temperature is constant speed of the molecules is not going to change because kinetic energy will remain same so this is the one important information we should get by reading the question whenever the temperature remains constant the speed of molecule will also remain constant but another point when the volume reduced as we know that the syringe piston is compressed so the volume will get reduced so when the volume is reduced what will happen there will be less space for the molecules to move around so molecules will hit each other and hit with the wall more frequently so here in this case this is happen that is when the volume reduces molecules will have less space to move so they will collide more frequently now we can look at the options option a says the pressure of air decreases because the molecules now travel more slowly but we have seen the molecules speed will remain same it's not going to increase its speed or decrease its speed so this statement he is wrong and we should conclude one more thing from this the explanation that when the volume reduced the molecules will collide more frequency frequently so when the molecules collide more frequently the pressure will increase this is most important conclusion we should come so option a is wrong option b says the pressure of the air decreases again that is wrong because we have seen as molecules collide more frequently here the pressure of the gas will increase so option b is also wrong option c the pressure of the air increases that is correct because its molecule now hit the syringe walls more frequently yes we have just seen that so the correct answer is option c question number 15 in an experiment smoke particles are suspended in air and viewed through a microscope the smoke particles move about with short random movement which of the following statement is correct so this is very important that smoke particles are suspended in air so we should have a clear idea about smoke particles and air particles so the air particles are very very small which we cannot see even by a microscope but the size of the smoke particles is comparatively greater than the size of the air particles so with the help of a microscope we can see dust particles but we cannot see air particles because dust particles or smoke particles are having a greater size and mass comparing to the size and mass of air particles but these air particles they are continuously moving in random direction with in straight line but random direction so as these 
air particles are moving randomly they will continuously heat this smoke or gas particles which will make the smoke particles also move in random direction so initially the very small and light gas particles are moving randomly and when they hit the smoke particles they are having a larger size and mass comparing to gas particles will also start to move randomly so you can note down these points first of all gas particles they are very small and light move randomly in straight lines and these gas particles will collide with the dust or smoke particles present in this gas which will cause the smoke particles also to move randomly now we can look at the options option a says that air particles have large masses compared to the smoke particles that is wrong as we have seen air particles are having very less size and less mass comparing to the smoke particles smoke particles we can see with the help of a microscope but air particles we cannot see even with the help of a microscope so option a is wrong option b air particles have large masses compared to smoke particles so again that statement is wrong option c says air particles move at high speed comparing to smoke particles and they move in one direction only the air particles moves randomly not in one direction so option c is also wrong going to option d air particles move at high speeds that is correct comparing to smoke particles and they move in random direction this statement is correct so option d is correct question 16 the graph shows how the internal energy of 1 kg of a metal changes with temperature so we are provided with a internal energy temperature graph you can see when the temperature increases from 0 degree to 100 degree how its internal energy is increasing which is given in the graph what is the increase in the internal energy of the block of the same metal of mass 0.25 kg when its temperature rises from 40 degree celsius to 50 degree celsius so here we need to find out the increase in internal energy of the block of mass is given mass is 0.25 kg when the temperature rise change in temperature is also given delta t also we can find out so in order to calculate the energy or internal energy we can use the equation internal energy is mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature and mass is already provided change in temperature is also provided but specific heat capacity is not given in the question but with the help of this given graph we can calculate the specific heat capacity first then we can substitute in the equation in order to find the increase in internal energy so specific heat capacity is equal to internal energy or energy over mass times delta t now from this equation we can see at the lhs we have e over t that is the internal energy over temperature and looking at the graph we can understand that energy is given in the x axis y axis and temperature is given in the x axis so e over t that is nothing but the y axis value over x axis value that is the gradient of this graph so that is equal to energy which is on y axis over temperature which is on x axis so instead of e over temperature we can write down that is gradient so we can rewrite the equation specific heat capacity of this particular metal is the gradient of the given graph over mass 
so we can calculate the gradient so we can consider the whole triangle from here to here and this is y1 this value is y2 and this value is x1 and this value is x2 so gradient is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 all divided by mass so y2 is 830 minus 800 over x2 is 100 minus 0 over mass of this metal is 0 0.25 and we will get 0 0.3 kilo joule kg raised to minus 1 degree celsius raised to minus 1 so now we have calculated specific heat capacitance c also then we can substitute in this given equation that is the internal energy is equal to mass mass is 0 0.25 times specific heat capacity that is 0 0.3 kilo joule so we should multiply with 1000 to convert kilo times change in temperature that is 50 minus 40 degree celsius so 10 and the answer is 750 joule so correct answer is option c question number 17 a piece of melting ice at 0 degree celsius and a beaker of boiling water are both in a laboratory the laboratory is at 20 degree celsius what is happening to the temperature of the melting ice and what is happening to the temperature of the boiling water so here there is one important information is given the ice is melting and water is boiling that means the phase change is happening in both the cases so during phase change all the energy is used to simply change the state of that matter so in that time the temperature will remain constant so this is very important during any phase change the temperature of that system will remain constant so here during this phase change that is when the ice melts the temperature will remain constant or even when the water boils the temperature will remain constant hence the correct answer is option a question 18 one end of a copper rod is heated what is one method by which thermal energy is transferred in the copper rod so thermal energy will be transferred in copper rod by conduction basically the, there are three process by which the thermal energy will be transferred one is conduction the second one is convection and the third one is radiation but in solids the heat transfer by the process of conduction and basically conduction is by two types or two different methods are there under conduction the first one is due to the movement of free electrons that is if you have a copper rod and if he heat it up at one end the free electrons available at the end next to this hot end will get more energy and they starts to move to the other side so this heat will transfer to the other side like this due to the movement of the free electrons from the hot edge to cold edge the other way through which the conduction occur or heat transfer in solids are due to lattice vibration so here again we can consider a copper rod and where the atoms are arranged in a lattice manner because it's a solid again when we heat it up at one end these atoms or these lattice starts to vibrate this vibration will transfer energy to the next atom so this vibration will continue to transfer to neighboring atoms so this vibration will 
spread to the other end of the copper rod so this is also one way the heat can transfer so these are the two ways through which the heat transfers in solids and this is basically known as conduction so let's look at the option which of the option defines correctly about conduction the first option says free electrons transfer energy from the cooler end to the hotter end but we know that from hotter to cooler end the energy transfers so this is wrong option b says that free electrons transfer energy that is correct from hotter end to colder end yes that point is correct so option b is correct anyway we can look at option c and d option c says that molecules of copper move from cooler end to the hotter end that is wrong first of all molecules of copper they cannot move they can only vibrate as it is a solid we have seen they have to stay in a fixed position so molecules cannot move and it says so the option c is wrong option d molecules of copper moves again that is also not possible any molecules in any metals they cannot move but they can only vibrate question 19 which change will cause a decrease in the rate of radiation emitted by an object so here the rate of radiation emitted should decrease so emission of radiation should decrease so we so we can look at the emission of radiation in different objects emission of radiation will be more in the object they are having a black color black or dull texture these kind of objects will emit radiation more whereas the objects they will emit radiation less are having the color white and shiny texture so in this question it's mentioned that rate of radiation emission should decrease that means it must be less then we need to satisfy this condition that is the object should be white and shiny so let's look at the options option a says that changing the surface color from white to black but we have seen for black color objects the emission will be more so this is wrong option b says changing the surface texture from dull to shiny and that is correct we have seen that for shiny materials the emission will be less so option b is correct option c says increasing the surface temperature when temperature increases the emission will increase so that is wrong and option d says increasing the surface area when surface area also increase the emission rate of emission will increase not decrease so option d is also wrong question number 20 What is the approximate wavelength in air of the highest frequency sound that can be heard by a normal healthy person So we know that the audible frequency range is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz or 20000 hertz So a normal human being can hear only the sound within within the range of 20 hertz to 20000 hertz so the maximum frequency which we can hear is 20000 hertz so we need to calculate its corresponding wavelength so for the 20000 hertz of frequency what is its corresponding wavelength for a sound wave so we can estimate the speed of sound in air as 340 meter per second then in order to calculate lambda you can use wave equation that is speed of a wave is the product of frequency times wavelength so speed is equal to frequency that is 20000 hertz times sorry here we need to find out wavelength so we can make wavelength as the subject so we will get wavelength is speed over frequency we have the values we can substitute that is 340 over 20000 and we will get 
zero point zero one seven into SF zero point zero two meters. Hence, the correct answer is option A. Question twenty one. What causes the change in direction when light travels from air into glass? So this is a question based on the process refraction and in refraction we know that when light is moving light or any wave is moving from one wave to another wave suppose the light is moving from air to glass as mentioned in the question so we can draw a normal for the reference normal should be always perpendicular to this boundary so there should be a 90 degree this is an imaginary line for the reference and this is known as normal so when a red light passing through air and when it reaches at the boundary instead of moving straight speed will change speed will reduce because glass is more denser so that it will bend towards the normal so instead of moving straight this will be the new path of the red light and the reason is speed of light changes when light travels from one medium to another medium so it will bend depending upon whether it's moving from denser to rarer or rarer to denser hence the correct answer is option d it says the speed of the light changes option a says the amplitude of light changes amplitude of light will be same the color of the light changes that is also wrong because frequency will remain same so when the frequency is same the color will be same option c says the frequency of the light changes we have already discussed it will not change only speed and hence the wavelength will change question 22 light from a torch is incident on a plane mirror the angle of incidence is 38 degree what is the angle of refle reflection so in order to answer this question we can use laws of re reflection according to the laws of reflection angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection so here angle of incidence is 38 so the angle of reflection will also be 38 so the correct answer is option a going to question 23 Two rays with an angle of incidence of 60 degree pass into dilute and concentrated sugar water solution. The refraction are shown. Which row is correct? So here first we need to check about the refractive index as concentration increases. So what will happen to the refractive index N? when the concentration of the solution increases so by comparing these two solution we can understand that we have dilute and concentrated solution so the concentrated solution is having a less angle of reflection comparing to dilute sugar so from this we can understand more concentration means more density that means by comparing this angle of refraction angle of refraction is less r will be less or angle of refraction will be less for more concentration so this is the first point we can conclude from the figure that when the concentration of the solution increases its angle of refraction will be less now in order to check what will happen to refractive index we can look at the equation of refractive index that is sin i over sin r and we have already seen for the solutions with high concentration the angle of refraction is reducing so the whole sin r will reduce so when the denominator value is reducing the value of n will increase so the refractive index will increase when the angle of refraction reduces so option a and b are wrong now we can look at the second point that speed through the solution as concentration increases here we should understand that when concentration increases or more concentration means more density so the speed will be less 
speed will be less or speed decreases hence the correct answer is option c where the refractive index will increase and the speed will decrease so the correct answer is option c going to question 24 a thin converging lens is used to produce a sharp image of a candle the various sharp images are produced on the screen by moving the lens and the screen backward and forward which statement is correct so let's look at the options which statement is always correct this is very important always so option a says the image is at the principal focus or focal point of the lens in order to get the image at fo principal focus the object should be at infinity but here the object is not at infinity so the option a is wrong option b says the image is bigger than the object that is not always correct which is depending on where we keep the object whether it's in between principal focus or on principal focus or beyond principal focus so that is depending upon the position of the object so option b is also wrong option c says the image is closer to the lens than the object this is also depending upon the position of the object option d says the image is inverted as we can see we have an image at the other side of the lens which is a real image and you can see the image is inverted always the real images will be inverted so option d is correct question 25 which row gives the approximate speed at which ultraviolet waves travel in air and in vacuum so the speed of air in vacuum and air are almost the same and that is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second so correct answer is option d question 26 the diagram represents a sound wave what are the names of the parts of the sound wave labeled x and y so the region where the particles are more close together are known as compression so here x is compression and the region where the particles are more apart are known as rare fraction so here y is rare fraction hence the correct answer is option b question 27 the speed of sound is different in different states of matter the speed of sound in liquid water is 1500 meter per second which row correctly conveys the speed of sound in ice and the speed of sound in water vapor with the speed of sound in water so we have three states one is ice that is solid then liquid water then water vapor and speed of sound in liquid is given that is 1500 meter per second so we need to find out what will be the speed of the same sound in ice and the speed in vapor so here we should know that speed of sound is greatest in solid then liquid then vapor so the speed will be always highest in any solids then liquid and least will be in gas so the speed will be something greater than 1500 plus in solid or in ice but in gas or in vapor it will be less than 1500 here it's option c says in ice more than 1500 and in steam it's less than 1500 so correct answer is option c question 28 three methods to demagnetize a magnet are suggested the magnet is in an east west direction point one heating the magnet repeatedly with a hammer second point heating the magnet until red hot and the final point withdrawing the magnet from a coil which has a direct current dc in it which methods demagnetize the magnet so out of these three 
methods using which all magnet uh, methods we can demagnetize so let's uh, look at each statement the first one's the heating the magnet repeatedly with a hammer is a correct method so option 1 is correct and statement 2 says heating the magnet until red hot that is also another method to demagnetize statement 3 states withdrawing a magnet from coil which has direct current dc in it so here in order to demagnetize a magnet we need to slowly withdraw a magnet in east west direction until it is some distance away from the solenoid while an ac current is on or alternating current is on not dc current so the third method is not correct using third method we cannot demagnetize as there is a dc current it must be ac current so 1 and 2 only option b is the correct answer question number 29 three cores of different metals p q and r are placed inside identical coils of wire at least one of the metals is non magnetic the cores are held above some iron nails the three diagram shows what happens when there is a current in the coil the three diagrams below show what happens when the current is then switched off so you can see when a current is flowing through the coil what happens when the current is flowing metal q and metal b becomes magnets that's why they are attracting the iron nails then later the three diagrams below shows what happens when current is then switched off so we can see when the moment current switched off the nails which got attracted to the metal q just fall down automatically but in metal r they are still attached that means metal r is still maintain its magnetic property that metal for metal q it will act as magnet only when there is a current and metal p even though there is a current it's not behaving as a magnet so which core metals are magnetic here we have seen when there is a current flowing in the coil Q and R both attracts the iron nails because both are acting as magnets. So in this question, metal Q and R both are magnetic metals. Therefore, the correct answer is option D. Question thirty: Two uncharged metal spheres X and Y rest on insulating stand and touch each other. a negatively charged plastic rod is brought near to the sphere x using the insulating stand sphere y is moved away from sphere x what are the signs and the relative magnitudes of the charges induced on x and y so initially both sphere x and y they are uncharged uncharged means both positive and negatively charged uniformly distribute over the spheres and they are touching each other let's check what happens to these charges when there is a negatively charged rod brought near to the sphere x here all the positive charges or many of the positive charges from the sphere x and y will move to the left side as there is the presence of a negatively charged rod so opposite charges will get attracted and the negative charges from sphere x also will move to the opposite side the reason is opposite charges attracts and same charges will repel so the negatively charged free electrons will repel from this negatively charged rod so they will move to the opposite side now using the insulating stand the sphere y is moved away from sphere x so we can see now sphere y is 
away from sphere x so now in sphere x less number of electrons or it consists of more positive charge and which will distribute but in sphere y it consists of more negatively charged electrons so it will have equal number of elect uh, negative charges so sphere x has positive charge and sphere y has negative charge now so let's look at the options sphere x is positive and charge on y is negative so that is the correct option only option given and relative magnitude of charges they are equal that means if there is 100 positive charge in y there will be 100 negative charge the correct answer is option c question 31 which two charges to a metal wire both decrease its resistance which two changes so we have a metal wire and in order to reduce its resistance what all changes we should make to this metal wire so we can look at the equation of resistance that is resistance is equal to resistivity of that metal times length over area of cross section so in order to reduce its resistance the length which is at numerator also should reduce or the area of cross section which is at the denominator should increase so the length should decrease and the area of cross section should increase correct answer is option b question 32 there is a current i in a resistor of resistance r for a time t the potential difference across the resistor is v which equation gives the energy e transfer by the resistor so it's a very easy equation we need to get the equation of energy and energy is power times time where power equation in terms of electricity terms is power is the product of voltage and current times t so we will get e is v i t here the correct answer is option d question 32 a resistor r is connected in parallel with an 8 ohm resistor the resistance of this combination is 4 ohm what is the resistance of resistor r so we have a parallel combination of two resistors where the total resistance or combined resistance rt is given that is 4 ohm so here we can use the equation to calculate r total that is r 1 over rt is equal to 1 over r1 here simply 1 over first resistor unknown resistor r plus 1 over second resistor that is 8 ohm so by taking reciprocal we will get rt that is the r total is the products of r times 8 over r plus 8 so we can take this denominator to the lhs of the equation so we will get rt that is r total times r plus 8 equal to r times 8 where we have the value of r total that is 4 so we can substitute 4 in the place of rt or r total so 4 times r plus 8 is equal to 8r we can take 4 inside so we will get 4r plus 32 is equal to 8r we can take r terms to one side of the equation so we will get 32 is equal to 8r minus 4r that is 4r so 32 is equal to 4r hence r is 32 over 4 that is equal to 8 ohm correct answer is option d question 34 a student designs a circuit to use as a dimmer switch for a lamp what happens to the brightness of the lamp and the potential difference pd across the lamp 
when the slider is moved from x to y so we can check what will happen when the slider is moved from x to y when the slider is moving from x to y we can understand that the length will decrease when length decrease the resistance will also decrease so that the potential difference across it will also decrease so potential difference means voltage so we understood that voltage will voltage across the lamp will reduce now we know that the equation power is the product of voltage times current where we have seen when the slider moves from x to y the voltage will reduce so by looking at this equation we can understand when voltage reduce power will also reduce so as the power reduces it will result or it will affect the brightness because when the power reduces the brightness will also reduce hence the option a is correct the brightness will reduce and potential difference across the lamp reduce question 35 the circuit shown contains two gates which truth table describes the operation of the circuit so let's check dif at different inputs what will be the output so initially when we apply 0 0 at both the input the output from this not gate when the input is 0 will be 1 so for this OR gate the inputs initially 0 and 1 so the true table of a OR gate is given so from the truth gate we can understand when the inputs of an OR gate is 0 1 the output will be 1 now we can see the second option the inputs when it's 0 1 at P and Q so the output of the node will be 0 and the inputs of OR gates will be 0 and 0 so the output will be 0 0 of an OR gate the output is 0 now the third option is when input is 0 sorry 1 0 1 at P and 0 at Q so the output of Q from NOT gate will be 1 now the inputs of OR will be 1 1 so when 1 1 the output of an OR gate will be 1 and the last option when the inputs are 1 1 so the NOT gate output will be 0 then the OR gate inputs will be 1 and 0 so when the OR gate inputs are 1 and 0 the output will be 1 so the output will be 1 so this is the output when we give these inputs hence the correct truth table with output 1011 is option D question 36 the diagram shows an electromagnet near a coil of wire connected to a voltmeter the reading on the voltmeter is zero the switch is closed the electromagnet magnetizes quickly what happens to the reading on the voltmeter so here it's mentioned that when the switch is closed we know that there will be a current flowing through the coil and because of this current in the coil this electromagnet will become a magnet and which will produce magnetic field around it so suddenly it will produce magnetic field lines across this electromagnet the moment it switch on the current so these magnetic field lines are now linked with the secondary coil or the coil which kept in a soft iron so because of this sudden change in the number of field lines linked with the secondary coil it will cause a electromagnetic induction in the coil wound on soft coil or there will be a induced current in this secondary coil because of this sudden induced current the voltmeter 
will show a reading so the moment when the switches are closed the voltmeter reading will suddenly increase but as the current is keep on the number of field lines will be same so for secondary coil the number of field line is not changing so there won't be not that much current so the reading will decrease Therefore, the correct answer is option C. Initially, it quickly increases, then decreases. Question 37. Which graph shows the voltage output of an AC generator with the peaks and zeros correctly labeled? So, an AC generator will produce an AC current or an alternative current and which will flow in two directions. So, the voltage will have both positive and negative values. And we need to identify which graph has correctly marked peaks and zeros. So, peaks are the points where the voltage is maximum. And as it is a alternating current, V maximum itself will have in positive and negative side or in opposite directions. So, we will have one positive voltage maximum and one negative voltage maximum. And zeros are the point where the voltage value is zero. Now, we can look at the first option A. In option A, we can see this is a pulse, but it's not showing a negative side. But an AC current or an alternative current means it will have both positive and negative part. But here the negative part is not given. So this is not a graph of an AC current. Now we can look at option B. So again here voltage are having only positive values. But we have already discussed for an alternating current. Voltage will keep alternating to positive and negative values. It will have both positive and negative voltages. So instead of having all pulses positive, it was supposed to have one pulse positive, then the next negative, positive, negative, positive, negative in this way. So option B is also wrong. Option C, it's showing a correct shape of the graph because it has both positive and negative, positive and negative values. But when we check these zeros, we have already discussed. Zeros are the point where the voltage value should be zero. So when you are looking at this graph, we can understand the voltage value is zero only at x axis. That means these points where the voltage value is zero. So these points we have to call zeros. And here these are peak voltages that is minus V max or negative but negative value but the voltage is maximum here the voltage is maximum and here also peak or we will get a maximum voltage if one is positive other one will be negative so these are not zeros but these are also peaks let's look at option D in option D these the maximum values of voltage in both directions are correctly marked as peaks and the points where voltage is zero is also correctly marked as zeros so correct answer is option d question 38 three students are describing the structure of an atom Student 1, all the positively charged particles are in the nucleus. That is a correct statement because we know that an atom consists of positively charged nucleus. Because the proton is positively charged particles which is available inside the nucleus. And electrons, they are negatively charged revolving around the nucleus. So, that is the structure of a nucleus, an atom where electrons which are negatively charged revolve around the nucleus and the nucleus consists of neutrons and protons. 
and proton is positively charged so the whole nucleus is positively charged so student 1 said the correct statement describe the correct statement student 2 positive electrons are in the nucleus positive is correct but it's not electrons it's protons so the second student describe the atom incorrectly so that is not correct student 3 describe negative electrons that is correct electrons are negatively charged orbit around the nucleus yes that is correct so, so student 1 and student 3 describe the nucleus describe the atoms correctly which students are making a correct statement so we have discussed student 1 and student 3 making a correct statement so the correct answer is option C question 39 when alpha particles are incident on a thin metal foil most of them pass through undeviated what does this observation reveal about the nature of the atom so this question is from Rutherford's alpha particle experiment so here we should know that the alpha particles went straight through the atom because atom is mostly empty space that means when you consider an atom the nucleus is concentrated at the center in a very very less space comparing to the size of the whole atom and this nucleus is positively charged so when the positively charged alpha particles pass through the atom most of the atoms move straight away without any deviation because there is no presence of positively charged nucleus but very few alpha particles when they are moving they will deviate because of the presence of the nucleus and it will happen to very less alpha particle because the nucleus which is positively charged is staying in a very less space comparing to the size of the atom therefore the correct answer is option b question 40 a laboratory worker measures the count rate from a radioactive source he records his result in the table the average background radiation in the laboratory is 8 counts per second what is the half-life of the source so here we have a sample of radioactive element and initially when the time is zero its count rate is 100 but we should consider the background radiation also with this count rate so the actual count rate from the radioactive element will be 100 that is a total reading minus the background radiation reading that is 8 so the real count rate from the sample will be 92 so for every count rate we have to subtract it from the background radiation count in order to get the count rate of the source so after one minute the count rate of the source will be 73 minus background radiation that is 8 so we will get 65 like we can check for every count rate we need to subtract so we will get 46 here 41 minus 8 33 31 minus 8 23 now when the time is 0 the count rate from the source is 92 and the half of 92 is 46 so here after 2 minutes the count rate from the source is 46 that means from here to here it has gone through one half time or half life so the corresponding time is 2 minutes therefore we can conclude that 2 minutes is the half life of the source as it takes 2 minutes to reduce its count rate from 92 to 96 therefore the correct answer is option b if you find this video useful please subscribe my channel and like this video
थैंक यू